Hi, welcome. My name is Abby Hickman. I work in talent acquisition and university at re recruiting at, at Sierra Nevada Corporation. I have a wonderful panel here today with me to discuss their uh, journey in engineering and for you to learn a little bit more about our company. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Sierra Nevada Corporation is a trusted leader in the world's toughest challenges. Um, we offer uh, commercial space solutions, national security, um, and defense operations as well. Um, the company has been around for about 60 years and is headquartered in Sparks, Nevada. And we are one of the top 10 most innovative companies um, in the nation, and we're excited to share a little bit more about what we do. Um, so I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today. Um, we have Julie Fenimore, Scott Butler, Tara Neese and Andy Hardy. I'm gonna have each of them introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their educational background and their path into their current role. So um, Julie, if you don't mind starting, we'll kick it off with you. No, I'll be happy to. My name is Julie Fenimore. My official title is Engineering Manager 2-Systems. Um, what that really means is I'm the Systems Engineering Functional Manager for uh, IAS, which is Intelligence, Surveillance, Reconnaissance, Aviation, and Security. So it's an acronym and an acronym. Um, my education is I have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from the University of Kansas, go Jayhawks. And <clears throat> I've had, uh, I'm about a quarter of a way through right now a master's in unmanned aerial systems because I love UAVs. Um, my, and like I said, I think I got my current role. Uh, past experience. Um, gosh, I have 30 plus years experience. I have, I, I was counting it up. I actually have 30 years total in uh, Raytheon and its legacy companies. Um, and then I had a couple of years at a company called KBR, a couple of years at a small company that was uh, wholly owned, and now I'm here at SNC. So I've been doing this for, yeah, a very long time. Awesome. Thank you, Julie, for sharing. Uh, Scott, we'll go to you next. I'll just move through my, my tiles. Sure. Um, Scott Butler, uh, I'm from North Carolina. Spent about uh, 12 years in the, on active duty working on uh, an ECM pod in the Air Force. I got out. I went to CU Boulder uh, to pursue my electrical engineering degree. Once I graduated, I spent about four years doing project management and infrastructure at Buckley Air Force Base, and then uh, transition, transitioned um, over into uh, electrical engineering here at SNC about eight years ago. Um, in the last couple years, um, I've been doing systems engineering on the Gorgon Stair uh, program under the pod systems in our directorate. Thanks, Scott. Right, Taryn, we'll move to you. Hi, um, my name is Taryn Nicey. I am a director of technology here at SNC. Um, I've been with SNC for about seven years. Um, I have a bachelor's in software engineering and actually computer and information sciences. Um, so my background is software. Uh, I used to be a software engineer, I guess. I, I like to consider that I still am. Um, I have several certifications in, in different technologies, um, anywhere from system uh, system and software architecture to uh, actual technologies such as Oracle databases. Um, again, my role as a director of technology here, um, and I've I've been with SNC for seven years, as I stated, but I've been in defense for about 15, and I've also done a few stints in the commercial world. So. One of the things that I enjoy about doing that is going out, you know, seeing what's out in the commercial world and, and then coming back to um, the defense world. So, thanks. Great. Thanks, Taryn. Andy, last but not least. Hi, I'm Andy Hardy. I'm a director of engineering here at our business area. Um, I graduated from Texas A&M with a mechanical engineering degree. Um, my first few years of my career, I did uh, mechanical engineering design work. Um, I uh, initially worked at a direct competitor at SNC um, doing that. And then uh, about who, coming up on 12 years ago, I uh, came to SNC um, and continued to do mechanical design engineering work. Um, had a 
few different engineering leadership positions, both within uh, mechanical engineering at first, and then kind of more into multidisciplinary uh, engineering leadership positions. Um, and then a few years ago, um, moved into what we call engineering management, and then uh, actually earlier this year um, became our, our director of engineering. And so kind of oversee um, multidisciplinary engineers right now within what we call uh, design engineering disciplines. Awesome. Well, thank you all for sharing a little bit of your background um, and your positions at SNC. Um, so I do have a series of questions, um, so I'll moderate the panel as we move through those, but please feel free to be as candid as you feel comfortable with as you're sharing your experience. Um, so the first question is, what advice do you have for students starting out in their career journey? Um, we'll go backwards this time. We'll start with Andy. Um, yeah, so it's... I, I, my answer is kind of a maybe an obvious one, but I feel like some pipe, sometimes it doesn't get explained very well. So what I'd say is, is figure out what you want in your career. Um, and, you know, I remember when I was first getting started, when people would give me advice like that, I was like, great. I, what does what does that mean? How, how, I have no idea. It seems like the possibilities are endless. What do I do here? Um, and it's really not as hard as it sounds. It, and so really it's, in my mind, it, it, you need to figure out there, like, what big picture things do you want to be involved with? Do you really like, like, if you're getting an engineering degree, do you want to really remain very detailed, technically focused? Like, that is part of what you want to do. Um, and so, you know, help shape your career in that mind. Um, if you want to be a leader of engineers, um, you know, you want to lead a design effort, you want to lead an analysis effort, you want to lead in some capacity, that is, you know, another way that you can shape your career. Um, you know, there's lots of other areas um, along those lines. If you want to become a manager is, is another example. Um, but have those things in mind um, as you are, are, you know, beginning your career and as you're talking with what becomes your managers or what opportunities are presented your way and use those things that you've thought about, hey, this is what I like doing to, to shape the conversations that you're having and then, you know, influence the people that, you know, you, you get to talk with that have influence over your, your career. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Andy. Taryn. Um, one of the uh, advice that I, the advice that I would have for folks starting out in their career is to um, not be afraid to take a job out of your comfort zone. Um, one of the first jobs that I ever took uh, was actually working for 3M in um, and creating software that allowed the DMV to send um, license plate information to the prison system. Um, not your ideal first job out of college <laughs> at all um, to go into um, prison and train inmates. Um, so, but it did actually teach me a lot about networking and how and security that actually has to happen around those transactions. And um, it helped it helped it helped me look at um, how to build how to build in my discipline a lot broader than what I was learning in school. And so I would say that every opportunity that you have will teach you something. And um, and to and to definitely step out of your comfort zone, even in um, individual roles and responsibilities sometimes the the things that you're given are, are tasks that you think are not that great and then you it turns out to actually be one of the best teachers that you ever had um so i think that that's that's a big um advice that i would give anybody uh starting out is to say you know look at the opportunities in front of you and even the ones that don't sound that great you can turn into something that uh you really learn a lot from great thank you for sharing uh, scott I think you're on mute, Scott. Well, so a lot of the good answers have been taken. I would um, just, I, I agree with everything that Andy and Taryn have said. Um, in my career, I've had a lot of different um, opportunities and a lot of different uh, roles before I became an engineer. And I continue to feel like um, I take lessons from being, um, a technician on an electronic warfare system or being um, someone who 
did patient care for a short period of time, um, learning how to communicate, learning how um, how I work, and, and 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 using those to further my engineering career. Those things, those experiences have been important. So I would I would agree that it doesn't really uh, it doesn't always seem obvious what uh, your role is and how it can help shape your career, but look at it as a learning experience. And quite often you'll find there'll, there'll be something that will help you later on um, as you develop a discipline as a young engineer. Great, thanks Scott. Julie. Okay, I guess the thing that I would say is don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, coming out of school, um, I've seen two different types of people come out of school. The people who know they don't know everything and haven't got a problem asking questions, and then there are the people who think they do know everything, and usually that's not the case. So um, don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, everybody who is in your chain of command, as it were, in your supervisory chain, people that you work with, um, if they've been there longer than you have, they know more about what's going on than you do. And they are, they were there at one point in time, and they usually, uh, I've, I've never found a case where I was in a place, especially at SNC, where asking a question was a dumb thing and somebody thought you were stupid asking it. People want to help you. They want you to be a success because your success ends up helping their success. Great. Um, thank you all for sharing. Um, so how did you recover from mistakes you made early in your career? And maybe what mistake did you make that taught you the greatest lesson? Um, Scott, we'll, we'll start with you first. Um, definitely being uh, willing and flexible was very important. Um, as, as, the, as I started at SNC in, the, uh, in 2008, um, I made a big change from working um, in infrastructure to going back to um, electrical engineering design work. So less project management and more actual um, design work. So I had to be flexible and willing uh, to take uh, a different position than I had been used to. And I had to be, uh, you know, willing to, to take a longer drive, but to, to that path to getting back to design engineering um, wasn't exactly what, it wasn't a lateral move for me, it was more of a step down, but it allowed me to grow and uh, become a better engineer from those opportunities. Great, thank you. Uh, Taryn, let's get to you. Um, so I was, I came out of school around the time that the dot-com boom um, was just happening. And so um, a good part of my first jobs I was laid off from. The companies either went belly up or the partnership dissolved or um, or they grew too fast, too quickly. And then um, it, you know, it popped. And so I, before I entered the defense industry, I was actually laid off from my job five times, and that was within five years of me leaving college. <laughs> so um, um, I think the biggest thing to that I helped me recover was to know, to not give up, and to um, continue to look for those opportunities and really um, look to other folks that you're around and surround yourself with people that um, – are positive and really want to help you grow, but also continue to look for opportunities, like I said earlier, that aren't, aren't necessarily right in your swim lane. Um, I never would take the plunge to defense. Um, it was kind of a, a, you know, I had heard that they're behind the times, especially from a software perspective. Um, they don't keep up commercials faster, but I realized that I really ended up, um, once I took a chance and I started working on programs, I was sold um, and really started to grasp um, the mission and, and what it was doing, what what we do. Um, and so I think that the you know to even if you make mistakes and even if mistakes are handed to you or not necessarily mistakes that you've made, but um, external forces that have um, kind of given you a hard a hard um, 
deck, I guess, or a hard deal. Uh, I think the the biggest thing is to not give up and to keep pursuing and to keep um, networking and um, and then take what what you learn from those mistakes and and feed those into becoming a better person and a better um, mentor to other people. Uh, cause that's the other thing you can always, um, share those mistakes with other folks. And as you're sharing those, you, you also learn even more. So I think that's, that's, um, one of the ways that I recovered from, uh, those facts. Awesome. Thanks, Taryn. Uh, Julie. Well, I think I've shared this once before with a different group. Um, about probably five or six years, maybe 10 years into my career, I was in the midst of, um, moving from one part of a very large program to another and uh, had a talk with my boss who I thought had told me that, oh, yeah, you're going to get a big promotion in all of this. And I thought, oh, okay, that's pretty good. And then another division or another group within this com- this program said, well, we'd like to talk with you. So I went down and I did the interview and, and the man who was interviewing me basically said, well, you know, you're going to stay at the same level that you are. And I said, well, I've already been promoted. Yeah, terribly arrogant. Um, and the long story short was it, the promotion really wasn't through yet, and it was just kind of in somebody's mind, and, of course, it was exactly what I wanted. So I basically made a fool of myself with not only my current manager but with the guy who wanted to hire me. So um, I had to um, kind of eat my hat and apologize to everybody with my because of my arrogance. Um, and I learned a very, very hard lesson um, that um, don't assume things, don't um, don't think you're God's gift engineering or whatever, because uh, you aren't. <laughs> but um, I recovered, and you know, in the long run, everybody kind of laughed about it. I mean, I was mortified, but the the people who whose difference, it, it, I mean, it made a difference to them that it, they were able to not be bothered by it. And that made a lot of, that made me feel much better. And believe me, I became much more humble after that. (laughs) Thank you for sharing, Julie. Andy. Um, So early in my career, I I was doing design engineering work, um, creating CAD models, creating drawings, those kind of things. Um, And I'd say one of the kind of common pitfalls I, I would come into is just really not communicating enough about my designs. Um, and so, you know, we, we call that uh, oftentimes not getting appropriate stakeholder buy-in. And so, like specific examples, um, way too many times was, you know, as a design engineer, it's really easy to, to focus on your screen and, and what you're working on in CAD and um, not realize that, hey, there's people in the world that are going to have to actually use that thing I'm designing, right? And not only use it, but also um, we work on airplanes, so they actually have to install it on the airplane. And so I, I would, you know, it too many times um, ran into scenarios where um, found out I didn't talk to the right people, being oftentimes uh, maintainers, uh, operators um, of, of the equipment that is going to be installed on our aircraft and find out, wow, that can't be installed or it doesn't work in the way that, um, in my mind, it, it's going to work because, you know, I just didn't have the right perspective. So really um, learned the lesson uh, hard way too many times of, making sure you're talking with all the right people early and often. Great. Thanks, Andy. Uh, It looks like Greasy Cole was able to join us. Greasy, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about your role at SMC, um, that would be awesome. Yeah. Hi. Sorry for being late, but thanks for having me. Uh, Yeah, so my name is Gracie Cole, and I'm currently an engineering aide, and I'm over at the Space Systems Group, so up in Louisville, Colorado, and um, I've done two internships uh, specifically over the summers, and the summer of 2019, I worked over at IAS on some military plane projects, and then after that, I moved over to SSG, and I've been working there since. And, um, yes, I'm currently a student at Mines, and I'll be graduating in December. And I um, currently am in pursuit of a full-time opportunity with SNC, and I've really liked my time here so far. 
Um, yeah, so that's my intro. Um, I can hop in on a question if you'd prefer, or I can get in on the next round. <laughs> uh, we'll get you in on the next round. Um, cause Great. I've got the next question being um, the favorite thing, your favorite thing about your job. Um, so we'll start with Karen since we haven't started with her yet. Um, actually, the favorite, I have a, a couple. Um, the, I have two. Um, one of my favorite things is that um, one, one of the things that I like about my job is that I get to interact with our customers and be able to understand how what actually impacts their lives. And I find that, that that's very helpful. But, um, uh, to Andy's point, you know, sometimes we're like, oh, let's build something. And then, and then you come to realize that that's not what they asked for at all. Um, and I, I really like the opportunity to talk to the customer and try and dig in and, and really glean out what they what they want. Um, and the second thing I really enjoy is the, the different things I get to do. Um, that's one of the aspects, but there's several aspects of my job that I really enjoy. And the changing um, dynamic of each day is um, something that I really enjoy. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Julie, we'll head, head to the top, top uh, squares of people. I think the thing that I like the most about my job is teaching. Um, you know, I've been doing this a very long time, and um, I've really come to like the specific thing that I work on, which is systems engineering. And I love teaching people about systems engineering because whether you've been doing it in the past, you haven't done it the way I've done it. And so, you know, we share um, learning experiences. If I'm dealing with somebody who has a lot of experience, if I'm dealing with somebody who has absolutely no experience, um, I very much enjoy uh, sharing uh, what I think is a really cool uh, type of engineering. And so there it is, teaching. Thanks, Julie. Scott? Um, my favorite part is the technology that we get to put our hands on. And uh, here at IAS, we are uh, largely um, integrators. So we take the newest and uh, the, the, the most uh, interesting technologies and bring them to the customer to add to their capabilities and their the support of the mission. Um, so I really, really enjoy that part of my, uh, about my job. I really love the challenge of being a systems engineer, um, getting to understand and learn more about the other disciplines, um, mechanical and software especially, um, has been a lot of fun for me, especially on Gorgon Stair. Um, and frankly, uh, I really just love the culture. So I've had other jobs where I didn't have to come to work and, 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 and have fun, let's just say, but, uh, here we always do have fun. I think we have a great group. I think we have a great organization. Um, I'm sorry if I interrupted earlier, but, uh, John McCacken just, uh, strode by and he's one of our senior, uh, uh, engineers in, in technology and people like that who I get to inter interact with from time to time who have, like Julie, a vast amount of experience that they're more than willing to share and teach, and it just makes me a better engineer all the time. Um, I love that part about my job. I really do. Thanks, Scott. A great story. Uh, Gracie. Yeah, one of my favorite things has been to take on the challenges that I just have no idea even where to start. And I have to do some background learning, research, talking to people, and basically getting to tackle these things that seemed like such a far reach and then figuring out how to make them work and make it happen. And, and that's, I think, made better by another favorite thing. Um, which is the people that we work with at SNC. I've had only wonderful experiences, and that makes the challenges a little more fun to tackle. Great. Thank you. Andy? Yeah, so I, I think there, there's a, a theme so far in a lot of these answers in, in that it, people have to do with the, a, a lot of the answers. Um, and, and my answer kind of is a, a combination of what kind of what Taryn and, and Julie were talking about. Um, in my current position as a director of engineering, um, I, I get to, to really help other uh, engineers out, um, help make their job easier, help make their job 
um, a little smoother, um, remove roadblocks. Um, and, and so, you know, we do that through trainings, do that through new tools, do that through um, different ways of doing things. Um, and I, I find a, a lot of fulfillment in, you know, helping uh, other people be able to do their job a little bit better, um, a little bit easier, uh, whatever the case might be there. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so um, a similar vein, but I guess the opposite question is, what is the most challenging aspect of your job? Um, we will start with Gracie. Yeah, some things that I think I've definitely had a noticeable learning curve with is, uh, knowing when to ask questions and when to spend the time to figure it out on my own. And I don't think I'm unique in that challenge, but I think there is a, a balance that's hard to achieve and understanding that there's so much value to work through something on my own, but I also have to be really cognizant of the time it requires and the efficiencies of accomplishing a task and so finding that balance has definitely been a learning curve for me, um, but I have also, I'm really grateful I've been able to be really open with that challenge in um, talking to my supervisors and mentors, and so I've been able to be a little bit more proactive and getting better at that. Great, thank you. Andy. Um, so in my current position as Director of Engineering, um, the way SNC is structured, um, I don't actually have uh, that many engineers who actually report to me, um, but under my influence is three, 400 engineers. And so, um, you know, leading that many engineers um, through influence rather than through authority um, is, is often a, a challenge at times. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a common thing um, in, in a lot of, uh, leadership positions is, is you, you lead through influence um, in a number of different ways. And so um, for me currently um, in, in my position, uh, that, that's a big challenge is, is figuring out how to influence people to do things differently or um, do things more efficiently um, when at the end of the day, I'm not their boss. And if they want to do something differently um, and their boss doesn't care, then they get to do that. Um, but maybe, um, you know, I, I have to figure out how to influence all these people to understand um, the point of view that I, I'm trying to get across. Awesome, thank you, Andy. Taryn. Andy stole my answer. Because <laughs> um, unlike you, I have no direct reports, and I feel all of my leadership has to be done through um, influence. But um, no, I think one of the other most challenging aspects of my job is I'm, I'm a new, um, I, as I stated before, I'm a software engineer by trade, and I'm a new director of technology, and I'm trying to figure out what that means. Um, and uh, actually, you know, he mentioned John, Mr. John McCacken, and he's one of my uh, mentors because I'm trying to figure out what this means. So um, I think one of the most challenging aspects of my job is moving from that transition of being an individual contributor where I'm actually writing the code and implementing integrating it onto hardware and working with the systems team and actually going out to the flight lines and things like that and moving into more of a um, advisor and guidance, guiding role and setting more strategy and um, things of that nature, um, but still being cognizant enough to uh, struggle, you know, doing some, some individual contributor things. So making the transition to, um, I guess, more of a, a leader um, and and being able to juggle the different um, the different obligations that 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 entailed um, I think is the most challenging right now for for my position great thanks Julie Andy stole my question or my answer too uh, <laughs> uh, as you can see a lot of us have have indirect influence I guess is the way to put it um, one of the challenges of systems engineering is um, we can bury you in process. We really can. We have lots of processes. We can go very deep with them. And the challenge uh, in a company that has programs that last three or four months to years is right-sizing that or being agile. And so trying to figure out the best way to train folks to understand when you can be kind of fast and loose with the processes 
and when you need to be more rigorous, that's a challenge. Great, thank you. Scott. Well, um, outside of the everyday challenges of the, the platform and, and just the, the technology uh, challenges that I have, I'm gonna say I've had, I've got a really great uh, balance of work life right now. And in the past, uh, that hasn't always been the case. Some of the programs that we have are challenging in the speed at which they are running. So that's a it's quite a challenge sometimes juggling everything you have as a spouse, as a parent with work. Um, but I, I, I mentioned that because one of the other things I love about SNC is I will just say that that the times when I have had those challenges was a great deal of support, both structurally and um, with the group of people I work for, from my supervisors, my coworkers, and frankly, I've, I've, I've had to lean on some folks sometimes, and I've been there for people to support them in their challenges. Um, so overall, um, I, that's just a, it's an opportunity for me just to say again how much I enjoy working. And it hasn't always just been because of the things I get to work on, but just life balance has been a fantastic aspect to working at SNC. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my next question for all of you is what are some skills and talents um, that you either have developed or, or working on developing that you think are helpful as you move through your career? And we will start with Julie. With me? Um, oh, who? Who are we starting with? Sorry. We'll go with you, Julie. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Well, it's real short. Listening. Learn how to listen. You will, you, uh, the, you know, the, I think the, the phrase is, um, you don't, you don't, uh, receive much when you're transmitting. And so, uh, uh, learning how to listen, learning when to keep your mouth closed will take you a long way. Great. Thank you. Scott. Uh, gosh, um, becoming more patient when it, uh, when it's time to understand requirements, I think is one of the things that I've gotten more recently, um, added to my skill set. Um, requirements are a much bigger part of understanding, uh, my tasks as a systems engineer than they, they seem to be when I was just doing electrical engineering design. So translating those, um, ensuring my requirements are testable and verifiable, et cetera. Um, that's been a real good um, uh, addition to my skill set, I'd say. Great, thank you. Gracie. Yeah, I'd say um, focusing on the quality of the connections you can make with people. Um, we all do team-based projects and it is so awesome when you know you can just count on these people or you can come to them with concerns um, and receive and give constructive criticisms and just building those relationships professionally um, and that'll take you a long ways. Great, thank you. Andy. Um, so I would say um, what's helped me a lot with uh, the leadership positions I've had um, both as a, you know, discipline leads um, and, and multidisciplinary leads as an engineer. Um, it's really been keeping myself and keeping the team organized. Um, so finding um, the tools in, in different ways that um, people communicate and keeping those organized so that we're on the same page and working towards the same goals. Um, and then along those lines is keeping things organized, but ensuring that you, you follow through on, on the commitments, right? And, and the, Keeping organized is what allows me personally to, to be able to do that is to be able to see, hey, these are the things we're working on or these are the things we're planning on working on and being able to make sure that they, they get completed um, and, and trying to make sure they get completed on time. Great, thank you. Taryn. Uh, I think that adaptability is a huge one. Um, 
And Julie touched on the other one, I would say, is know when to, to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Um, and really lean on folks that, um, that do or that, or that can find out for you. Um, adaptability, um, I don't know how many software projects that I've started and have been shelved. Um, so learning to understand that there, that, that things are always changing, things are always dynamic. Um, especially here at SNC, it's, um, we move pretty fast, as Scott, as Scott alluded to. Um, but I, I think that as long as you remain adaptable and communicate, um, be willing to say, I don't know, I don't know the answer. Um, I think that things uh, continue to move that fast. Um, but being adaptable and flexible is one that I would say is um, one that I would, I would put into my toolbox any day, so. Great, thank you. Uh, so my next question is, what do you think is important for students to consider if they're interested in a career in aerospace and defense? So whether that's from a job searching perspective or a career longevity perspective, um, any advice you have as they're considering entering into this field? Uh, we'll start with Andy. Oh, okay. Um, this is one I didn't have a great answer for beforehand, but I would say that um, Oh, if you, if you don't, we can move on to somebody else. You had yeah. mentioned knowing what you wanted long term in your career, so I thought maybe that could parlay into into an answer to this. Yeah, um, I mean that's that's definitely part of it. Is um, you know in, in aerospace, um, more so defense it is you know a, a lot of what you're working on is delivering uh, weapon systems to the to um, you know the end user, right? And weapon systems sometimes is a, a cargo airplane, right? And a cargo airplane is flying people or stuff around the world. Um, but you know, sometimes a weapon system is something that is there to to be what it sounds like a weapon, right? And, and so, um, if you're going to be in defense, um, make sure that you're all right with that fact, right? Um, that um, the the reality of our country is that we are at war many times. And war has its realities. And so um, if you're going to be working on a project um, that delivers a weapon system, um, be all right with that morally. Um, and uh, not just all right with it, um, but you, you need to be able to be um, proud of that and, and be um, glad that you're supporting the warfighter and, and supporting um, our customer um, to be able to defend our country. That's a great answer, Andy. I've actually worked with candidates in the past who have accepted the job and then um, reneged later because they realized that, uh, that they weren't comfortable with the implications of their job. So I think that's, that was a great answer, even though you said you didn't have one. <laughs> uh, Taryn. I totally second that. That was a really good answer. Um, uh, I think the other thing that is um, challenging working in defense um, for me at least, having worked in the commercial world, is the pace at which defense moves. Um, SNC is one of the faster defense contractors. However, I would still argue that defense moves a little bit slower than some of the other industries out there. Um, I know that we have a lot more certifications and, and checks and balances that we have to go through, um, but I also find that um, working for the government can also be um, a little bit more bureaucratic than what um, I would like just to be able to get the job done and move forward. So I think that one of the other obstacles um, caution folks with is just understanding that sometimes things aren't going to move as fast as you want them to. Um, doesn't mean that it's not moving, um, but realize that there's probably a big, a bigger barge in front of you than just, than just the question that you're asking. There's probably a bigger ramp implication. Um, dovetailing into what Andy was saying, there's probably a bigger reason why you can't do that. And so um, I think that, but that was something I had to learn was that we just, we move a little bit slower. Um, Thank you for sharing. Julie. Well, I guess one of the things that I didn't say when I was introducing myself is that uh, I also uh, have 20 years in the United States Navy, both active and reserve. Um, so, uh, like Scott, I was one of those people who actually was sometimes on, I won't say receiving, but the using end, perhaps, of things that the defense uh, industry builds. And I was um, pretty cool with that, actually. Um, you know, unlike what Aaron's saying, I, possibly in software, what, you know, again, I'm not a software person, but um, 
some of the coolest things I've ever worked on were defense related. And I have I have outside of defense uh, experience too. But you know when you when you know that you're building something that um, can help keep somebody from being killed or being seriously injured um, and uh, supports policies that you may or may not totally agree with. Um, it's still, uh, I find, um, very gratifying um, to work in the defense industry. Um, the other thing I'll say, and hopefully I'm not stealing, any, stealing anybody else asunder, but is that defense is a cyclical business. But if you look around and you've been around long enough, all businesses are cyclical. So, you know, you may be riding high for four or five years and then, you know, for some reason the budget gets clobbered and things get slowed down. Uh, it happens with everything. So don't be afraid of, of budgetary pressures on the defense industry because those budgetary pressures are in every industry. Great. Thanks, Julie. Scott. I really have heard a lot of great answers that I would love to just concur with. I don't I don't know that I have a lot more um, to add to that. I enjoy what I do, and I think if you're the kind of person who recognizes what we do as important for our country, um, you'll find it very satisfying to be uh, a part of uh, a part of what SNC does for our country. So, great, thank you, Gracie. Um, so I'm in a weird position to be speaking on this because I am just starting my engineering career, but. Um, I would say one thing that I've noticed has been advantageous is to have a nimble and varied skill set. And by doing so, I think you're able to contribute in ways that you wouldn't necessarily have predicted. And I think that speaks to the variety of projects that are encompassed um, in the aerospace and aeronautical industry. But because there's such a variety, the more varied your skill set can be, the more um, meaningful your contributions and um, can be. And and I think in as you grow that skill set and broaden that, I think you know career-wise you can become increasingly irreplaceable or indispensable to a team. And that's just one thing I've observed uh, from what I've seen so far. Great, thank you. Um, so, what do you foresee the biggest obstacle um, in the in the business moving forward in the aerospace and defense industry? Um, and if you have any insight on how SNC may overcome those obstacles, uh, Scott, we'll start with you. Um, so, I would say the challenges in the in terms of complexity of the system of systems that we are are working in um, and working on. It's probably going to be the biggest challenge. Um, I know SNC and Julian, I talked about a little bit before. Um, we are embarked on several efforts to update and um, increase our capability, especially in the digital domain and and with model-based systems engineering. Um, I still see the the transition into that being a very very large challenge for us enterprise-wide, and I think uh, from what I've seen, other industries outside of aerospace and defense, like the automotive uh, industry, they are also trying or grappling with um, that challenge of being able to keep, uh, keep tight control over the different inputs to a design and to a system as it goes through the process of, you know, uh, beginning to being fielded. So that to me sounds like the, the biggest challenge we have ahead. Great, thanks Scott. Uh, Julie. Well, again, I, I'll go back to my, my discussion about budgets. Um, you know, the defense budget goes up and down uh, with uh, the whims of the politicians and the state of the world. Um, and so the, the I think that's a challenge that, that all, all companies face and all defense companies face. I think the advantage that SNC has is we are profoundly diversified. Uh, I, I, you know, right beyond where I came from, um, 
really big company, really diversified. Uh, and SNC, SNC um, is, I would say, just as diversified. Um, you know, Gracie's working in the space business, uh, and we just do a lot of different things. We have a multiplicity of customers, and I think that having that level of diversity will um, let SNC hedge its bets uh, as as things get potentially. We don't know, but. You know, as things as things change, we know that it's going to happen. So the, the the diversification, I think, is a significantly smart move on the part of the company. Great, thank you, um, Gracie. I know you have a unique perspective on um, having not been in the industry very long and being um, still in college. But if you have any insight, we'll um, ping over to you. Yeah, I was actually thinking through my time working for defense contractors. Um, it's going to echoed Julie quite a bit because so I worked eight seasons in Antarctica and it's almost exclusively defense contractors that get those Antarctic science support contracts and I had worked under Raytheon down there as well and one thing and I, I was actually working down there at the time that it switched to Lockheed and the bidding process took a couple of years for them to decide and so I was able to work down there and see the effects of some of the budget impacts because the competition to get that drove the cost so low that quality was compromised. And so I could foresee that being something as competition increases in certain uh, facets of the industry. And like Julie said, I'm sure that will go up and down for different areas of the industry. But I could see, you know, it, to deliver a quality service or product, that scope creep would be very difficult <laughs> to avoid. And, and being able to deliver to the customer the quality that we expect from an SNC service, but at a competitive um, competitive rate. Thanks, Gracie. Andy? Yeah, so my answer is pretty similar to what Scott was saying. I, I think uh, the, the challenge of um, the buzzword we often hear in our industry is maintaining or creating a digital thread um, is the, the big challenge. And so what that really means, though, for engineers is right now um, we, we currently have a lot of different silos within in engineering even where um, a mechanical engineer creates a design, um, and then you have um, some sort of analyst, be it a structural analyst or maybe um, a flight science analyst, and they take that design and then kind of create their own version of that and then go analyze that other version. Um, and then, you know, both these two versions of the same thing um, might end up diverging from each other, and we don't even know it um, until maybe it's too late, or maybe it's, you know, we get far down the road and, one analyst talks to the designer and says, hey, I was thinking about this thing on your design, and the design engineer is like, that's not part of the design anymore. Um, and it's because we've allowed ourselves to have two different sets of tools. Um, and this manifests itself in a number of different ways. Um, you know, design engineers release a drawing, and then as soon as that drawing is released, um, then the people that have to actually do something with it, they buy stuff and they build stuff with it. Um, they usually create their own version of the document from there as well, and that can diverge from the design as well. So having a, a single source of truth, um, while would, would be really great for us, um, and so that, you know, we only have one place to go to for all the right data, but getting to that point um, and having consolidated systems to have that single source of truth is um, proving and will prove um, to be very challenging for us. All right, thanks, Andy. Um, and I know Scott has to jump off, so I'd just like to give him a quick thank you for being here. He's headed to an inter intern interview, so thank you also for yeah. supporting that program. <laughs> um, and we'll hope you have a wonderful afternoon. And then, uh, Taryn, we'll move to you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Um, I think there's two big obstacles to uh, the aerospace um, industry that's coming. Um, one is kind of a caveat to what they were saying before about budgets, but the acquisition strategy and how to do that in a in a in a way that we can actually start um, delivering an acquisition and defense um, 
probably should explain that a little bit, but how they get, how, how they acquire products. So how do they um, buy aircraft, buy platforms, whether it be a ship, a plane, a spacecraft, um, but also then how do they maintain that and update it? And um, that's what we refer to as an acquisition strategy or an acquisition. And I think that that strategy will have to change significantly in how, in how fast they're able to um, buy products just because of the changing landscape. Um, I think the second piece that's going to be huge is as we move to a more global environment um, and even beyond global environment of, of the systems that we're putting together, the data that those systems produce um, is massive. And being able to put that data in a usable format in front of a user or an operator or um, someone that has to action that um, data and look at that data, interpret it, and do something about it um, is becoming more and more challenging every day because of the vastness of the um, data. If you think of like a smart home and you think of what we didn't have before and you think of, you know, now you have your thermostat and your radio and you can, you know, Alexa, turn on my lights and um, well, all that is being, all of those things are being fed data and, and how we deal with that. I think that it's going to become a huge problem and then how to secure that information. Um, so I think that those are two big areas that defense um, will start to change and need to look at as they're going forward. Awesome. Thank you. Um, what is the biggest risk you've taken professionally? Nobody looks super excited about that question. Uh, we'll I'll take that one. Um, so okay, we'll start with Andy. Yeah, pretty Early in my career, um, I was still a design engineer, um, and I had a few leadership type positions um, within uh, mechanical engineering. That, that was my uh, discipline at the uh, beginning of my career. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, it felt like out of nowhere, um, I was asked to be the, the lead engineer. We called it a, a technical lead here at SNC on a, one of the biggest programs we had started to work on today. And, I immediately had to figure out how to lead, um, I don't know, how many different disciplines of engineers um, when, you know, a few weeks before, all I had ever really known was mechanical engineering. And so um, quickly coming up to speed on what a um, aerodynamicist does and what um, a test engineer does and what a certification analyst is responsible for figuring out all these different things very quickly on a very large and somewhat high profile program for SNC was uh, was big uh, and hard. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, it took a lot of, um, you know, having confidence in myself, but, you know, realizing when I didn't have the answer and when to go ask for help um, from, from uh, more experienced engineers or um, more, um, you know, people that might have the answer that, that I didn't have. Great, thank you. Uh, Taryn. Um, yeah, I was trying to think about this. Um, I think one of the biggest risks I ever took was actually, um, I left SNC for a while and um, I went and worked in the commercial world and I was so afraid to leave. Um, one, I had been in defense for 15 years and I was stepping back into a commercial environment and um, into a, into an area that I didn't know the technology. I didn't understand um, the, the, acquis the business model, how they did things, that you had to be first to market, that it was all about how fast you did things um, and the quality. Um, and it, it, depending on those two things, you got the money. Like it wasn't, it wasn't based, the entire business model was different. And um, it kind of, it, it was, very scary to me because even I've worked for several different contractors and um, even though they do things slightly different, the processes that the that the government has in place kind of leads us all to a similar um, a similar uh, business rhythm, if you will. And one thing that I realized was um, by going back into the commercial world, I was going to have to take a leap and and have to relearn all of that. And um, this was fairly recently, so. Um, I, I was very nervous to do that. Um, 
I'm glad I did because I think it gave me a new perspective and a new way of looking at things um, and also sets me up well for hopefully the changes that are coming within um, our industry. Um, ultimately, I came back. So, um, you know, I love SNC uh, so, <laughs> and I love our mission. Um, so um, that's that's one of the reasons that I came back. But it was a big risk that I took to 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 say, OK, I'm going to put my comfort. I'm going to put, you know, get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to go put myself in this in this field that I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and and, you know, ultimately, I, I chose to come back, but it was a really good experience. And I'm glad I did it. Great, thank you. Gracie. Yeah, so my biggest risk was definitely going back to school. So I'm getting my second bachelor's and I had um, a fantastic gap decade. Um, so I had gotten my first degree. I went to school for engineering and had some really heavy life stuff happen. And um, I was double majoring in music and playing field hockey and really just had too much on my plate and needed to prioritize my mental health. And so I dropped engineering and went with the music degree um, and then I ended up just really needing to go adventure and travel. And so I ended up getting a master's in recreation management. But um, there's always the part of me that really just was an engineer at heart and I found myself liking those components of any job I had, the efficiencies, the designs, the um, I even fell in love with fluid mechanics uh, by accident, which, you know, moving fuel around in Antarctica. So um, I really had to face the boiling pot on the back burner that um, was just wouldn't let me ignore it anymore. And it felt like a risk being in my mid-30s and totally switching directions, but really in the same sense. Uh, coming full circle to um, something I was passionate about, um, but it was definitely felt like a risk. And um, I think though it has um, proven to have the rewards that other risks have had um, simply by following what I was most passionate about, um, that it always felt like the right move. Great, thanks for sharing. Julie? You know, I, I mean, I, just like everybody else, I think I struggled with this question because honestly, I don't think I've taken what I would call risks. Um, I've taken some uh, leaps of faith, perhaps, uh, but I never felt that they were a risk. I always figured that whatever it was I was doing, I could, I could kind of power through. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier, and I did it on purpose, that, that I was in the, the Navy, uh, Navy Reserves. I was working at, um, at Raytheon and um, during the Iraq war was called to active duty. And um, I was a very senior officer um, and as a result didn't need to go. You know, I could have basically said no, but that wasn't the reason I was in the military. Um, and so uh, at a relatively advanced age and a very senior level, I went to Iraq for a year. Um, <clears throat> it was interesting. Um, it was very interesting. I learned a lot. Um, and it, the risk it, that ended up happening was when I came back, you know, as a defense contractor, you have to have, you have to take your reservists back, but you don't necessarily have to give them the job that they expected they'd get back. And uh, that did not happen to me. When I came, I came back, I got really kind of shoveled off to the side, um, made the best of it for about a year, and then said, no, we just can't do this anymore. So, uh, it was it, it was an interesting experience for a year. Um, it was a disappointing end to my time at Raytheon, but I survived. I you know I found other positions and I'm here now. And and I think um, the the things that I learned in the process were 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 worth it. They were worth it. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate hearing all of your unique um, backgrounds and uh, the stories that come out with these questions. So I appreciate your, your candor in sharing those. Um, one, we'll kind of wind down questions here, maybe a couple more. Um, the next question is, how would you describe the culture at Sierra Nevada Corporation? Um, anyone want to start or I can just move through the tiles again? I can go. 
Okay. Yeah, I I just consistently see a very team oriented culture, and I think that shows up in little things, but it obviously shows up in how we collaborate to serve the customer, and that's one of the things I've liked most about S and C. All right, great. We'll go to Taryn. Uh, she's got to jump off here shortly, so I'll let her answer this and then head out for the afternoon. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to need to um, head out. Um, so I think that I would describe the culture of SNC um, as um, ag a pretty, I mean, we have it in our tagline, as agile, um, fast moving. Um, I think that that is, is one aspect of it. I also think that there is a culture of people being willing to help you learn and understand the things that you don't know, um, especially if you're willing to say, you know, I don't know what that means. So um, I think that's one way that I would describe the culture of SNC. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks, Darren. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. Bye, guys. Um, so, yeah, I, I would kind of build on uh, what Taryn was talking about there um, with our agile um, culture um, that manifests itself a lot of times. And, you know, when you get us assigned um, a project as an engineer, um, the, the people that exceed well around here are, are the people that um, when they get stuck, they don't sit there and stew on it for a long time and, you know, go back to the desk and be like, Oh, I hope I come up with the right answer. It's the people who are, are willing and forthright to be like, hey, um, I, I'm stuck at this point. Can somebody help me figure out what's going wrong or why I can't do this or where do you start it or whatever the case might be. Um, it's a, um, a, a lot of people that are, are going out of the way to, to power through it and, and figure it out themselves. Um, but when they can't, they, uh, you know, ask for help to, and, and the help is pretty much always there for you to, to help you get going. Awesome. Thanks, Sandy. Um, Julie. And I'll end it up by saying I, uh, I think that the people at SNC are very welcoming. Um, I'm, I can pretty much guarantee you this whole group, I'm the newest person here. And I feel, have always felt very welcome. Um, and also, there is a profound depth of knowledge that I see in people. And um, you know, I've been around long enough that I can tell the BS from the, from the real life stuff. And um, I am really, really impressed with uh, uh, both breadth and depth of knowledge uh, and their willingness to share. All right, thank you. Um, well, that wraps up the questions that I had for today. Any last parting words for future aspiring engineers or comments on um, your current role or anything else that you'd like to share uh, with the students who will be watching this? Well, actually, I do have one thing. When I first started out uh, engineering, my very first engineering job, it wasn't at all what I expected, and I did not like it at all, at all. I was fairly convinced that I wasn't going to last a year. And here I am, 30-some <laughs> years later, um, still learning, still enjoying the work, and still being pretty psyched about coming to work. So, um, you know, the, 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 thing, the thing that's constant is change. And um, if, you know, if you end up with something that you didn't expect or you didn't really like, just hang on for a while. Like the weather, it will change. And if it doesn't, you change. You know, the, the world's not going to end if you don't stay in the same position for 100 years because pretty much nobody does that anymore. So um, just hang in there because it's, I mean, I have had an awful lot of fun throughout my career. And a job is really terrible if it's not fun. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. That's great advice. Uh, Andy yeah. or Gracie, parting thoughts? Yeah, I, I can echo what Julie was saying there. Um, my uh, my first year of my career was not exciting. Um, the job I had was not one I would wish on anyone. Um, but, you know, it, same as Julie, um, I hung on and, and um, it, it, I don't know, it was a couple years later, um, but I got to work on some really cool projects, um, at, even at that same company. And so um, it's uh, like Julie says, um, just hang on and it'll change. Or if not, you need to change. Uh, that's good advice. I also want to say that thanks for taking time to listen to us. Um, uh, we uh, appreciate your time and uh, hope you're able to gain a, a little bit of insight as to uh, either S&C or, or our industry. Thanks, Andy. 
Yeah, and I honestly, um, Julie and Andy, thanks for sharing all of your experience. I'm um, definitely a newbie here, and I definitely gleaned a lot from what you were able to share. So, yeah, thanks so much, and thanks for setting this up, Abby, and um, I hope some students are able to glean as much as I was able to today. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us um, from Sierra Nevada Corporation. We've all enjoyed chatting with you. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Thanks. Thanks.